I'm back with the second video in my Constellation series, a science, lore, and history grand tour using my own backyard astrophotography, and some astronomy ideas you can do at home or even outside the classroom. I'm Michael, and this is Cygnus. It's late summer. You and the family are camping over the weekend. The kids are finally in bed. You've secretly ate the rest of the Hershey bars for tomorrow's s'mores. The fire dies down. It's almost time to go to bed, but you happen to look up with your dark adjusted eyes and realize just how bright the Milky Way is. From the horizon to zenith, it dominates the sky. A river of darkness snakes through the soft glow of milky white stars. Three especially bright stars catch your eye, forming a triangle. If you look at each star, you might be more drawn toward a curious cross or kite shape that seems attached to one of the stars. These three stars form the Northern Summer Triangle, Altair, Deneb, and Vega. That kite or cross that you see? This is an asterism, or a star group, within the constellation Cygnus. Asterisms are like constellations, but less official groupings of stars that vary by culture. Cygnus lies right over the Milky Way from our vantage point on Earth, about 90 degrees away from the Milky Way's center, and above the plane of the solar system from our point of view. Something that can be often difficult to get your head around is that north, or above, for the solar system isn't the same north as Earth's polar north. Cygnus is the Latin word for swan. The scientific classification Cygnus Cygnus is the most swan of swans, or better known as the whooper swan, which would have been most familiar to the ancient Greeks and Romans that named this constellation. The Greek Kuknos is where the Latin name Cygnus came from, and where the myths and legends begin on the naming of this constellation. Unfortunately though, there just isn't one coherent story. In one story, there's Zeus, dressed as a swan, or maybe it wasn't Zeus. He, or maybe not him, were involved with Leda. There's some twins born. There's a somewhat important Helen involved. In another version, Phaeton caused a minor accident in his dad's solar-powered chariot. Zeus made sure he couldn't do that again. What a shock there. Kuknos mourned the loss of his brother Phaeton until he was placed in the sky. And then there's Kuknos, the son of Ares. At any rate, there's gods, titans, and then there was a swan involved. Bam, night sky. But there's a better story. Just as ancient, but with some actual consistency. In traditional Chinese astronomy, Tianjin, the name given to the same region as Cygnus, is the celestial ford. If you can imagine the dark lanes of the Milky Way as a deep river carved through the sky, Cygnus then is the shallow area in the river, or a ford. The stars in Cygnus are numbered Tianjin Yi, Tianjin R, and so on through the nine stars in the celestial ford. The legend goes that separated lovers, Niao Long, Qin Yi, the cowherd and the weaver girl, are allowed to reunite at this bridge on the seventh day of the seventh moon. And actually, that's Chinese Valentine's Day. Or one of them. I guess there's like six different Valentine's Days. Yikes. Deneb marks the location where a flock of magpies arrive, forming a bridge, and this allows passage over the river. The tale of the cowherd and the weaver girl explains how the river was created, why the pair were separated, and why each year they are allowed to meet. It's a great story to tell your kids or friends while watching the night sky. Names of the stars and objects in the night sky are so much easier to remember when they have a great story to tell. In modern times, a spacecraft built by Northrop Grumman and originally developed by Orbital Sciences ATK, called Cygnus, is one of several ways the International Space Station gets supplies from the United States. Hey look, a swan. Orbital Sciences had made a habit of naming their spacecraft after familiar constellations. But there's way more to see than a few star patterns, and star charts never give Cygnus due justice. So let's collect all of the light we can from this region, and zoom in to see what surprises hide within. The names for the major stars in the constellation Cygnus are mostly of Arabic origin, and the various objects we find inside have mostly American and European origins. Faint objects detectable only with large telescopes and sophisticated imaging equipment didn't get proper names until the last couple centuries, and thus we have the North American nebula near the bright star Deneb. This familiar-shaped hydrogen alpha emission nebula is a fairly close neighbor to us, just a short distance further than the Orion Nebula, in an extremely active star-forming region. Deneb means the tail of the hen, 
It turns out three very different cultures all separately associated this same region with birds. Zooming in a little closer is a dark patch of interstellar dust making up the Gulf of Mexico. The North American Nebula is surprisingly easy to photograph, but that's because it's quite full of stars that occupy the same shape. A tripod and any camera that can take long exposures, and really any lens, has little trouble resolving it. But next door to the North American Nebula is the Pelican Nebula. Whoa, Birdception. Another but much dimmer star forming region in Cygnus. Just a short distance away, and very close to the bright center star of Cygnus, is the Butterfly Nebula. This one has been a favorite target of mine over the years. For one, it's super easy to find. In most small refractor telescopes, you need only point the telescope at Seder and start producing images. Though this time, unlike the North American Nebula, you'll need a modified camera to really take advantage of all the red glow coming from the butterfly. Seder is Arabic for chest, as in the chest of the hen. To see our next Cygnus gem a little clearer from this wide angle, we're going to employ a few Photoshop techniques to the image. If we first mask the stars, and then employ something called a minimum filter, and then use a smart blur filter, well, just wow. Without the competition of the millions of stars in the Milky Way, the dark, red, and faint objects just pop right out. So what can you see now that wasn't readily visible before? The Veil Nebula is what pops out to me the most, having been totally obscured by what looked like just noise before. The closest bright star is Al Janaho, which translates to wing. No surprise there. Rather than a star forming region, this is an absolutely massive 8,000 year old supernova remnant from a former star 20 times more massive than our sun. It occupies a region of the sky about three degrees across, or almost six full moons worth of sky. It is believed that the Veil Nebula is 1500 light years away. And if that's true, that makes the full diameter of the Veil Nebula up to be about 36 light years across. The Veil can be broken into different sections, and they are often photographed independently, due to the sheer size of the target. In the Western Veil, we have the Witch's Broom, the Finger of God, and the Filament. The Eastern Veil contains what is sometimes called the Network Nebula. The presence of ionized oxygen, sulfur, and hydrogen contribute to two shades of deep red and two of deep blue-green spectral emission lines in the nebula. With special narrowband filters, all four can be separated out, resulting in a whimsical kaleidoscope. Some of the most interesting stars, or ones with the most historic significance, often have boring names. Meet 61 Cygni. Cygnus is Latin for swan. Cygni is the Latin genitive form, which means belonging to the swan. And 61, because it is the 61st star in the order of right ascension within the swan that English astronomer John Flamsteed had cataloged in the early 18th century. So, 61st star belonging to the swan. There are lots of star catalogs, and many stars have many different names. 61 Cygni is no exception. But what if I told you that's not one star, but twin stars orbiting one another? So now we need to call them 61 Cygni A and B. Okay, so modern astronomy isn't all that imaginative, I guess. But apparently Tatooine's two suns are just Tattoo 1 and Tattoo 2. But I digress. 61 Cygni A and B are just a measly 11 light years away. This is very close compared to the rest of the background stars in the Milky Way. This is like seeing the light from your next door neighbor's front porch with a city skyline in the distance. Just by moving a couple steps in either direction in your own yard, you can actually see that porch light move relative to the city lights in the distance. It turns out that that works for stars too. Parallax can be measured, and thanks to 61 Cygni being so close, and because Earth's position changes as it orbits the Sun, we can somewhat accurately measure the distance between Earth and 61 Cygni. In fact, it was the first star discovered to have parallax. So important was this, 61 Cygni first truly proved to astronomers, thanks to measurements from a lesser known astronomy superhero, Friedrich Bessel, that stars aren't just fireflies that got uh, stuck up on that big bluish black thing, but rather balls of gas burning billions of miles away. Or, well, it finally ended the last few holdouts among scientists at the time that still believed in geocentrism. Heliocentrism finally won. Or that the sun in the middle model must in fact be correct. By measuring the distance to another star, we can now understand the cosmos as a three-dimensional thing, rather than a flat plane. 61 Cygni we can now also call Bessel Star. But it has one more surprise. The concept that stars are moving relative to each other, something called proper motion. Of all stars visible to the naked eye, 61 Cygni A and B are among the fastest moving. 
Proper motion was actually discovered more than 100 years before parallax was by Edmund Halley. Halley compared bright stars on sky charts created by Greek astronomers almost two millennia before him and hypothesized that stars were actually moving. Italian astronomer Giuseppe Piacci discovered the very fast proper motion of 61 Cygni. Through a telescope, it noticeably moves across the sky from year to year. And so now we have a new name, Piacci's Falling Star. Cygni A and B, or Piacci's Falling Star, or Bessel's Star's duality, parallax, and proper motion are all technically within the realm of amateur astronomers to measure and photograph, so give them all a try. The Crescent Nebula, or Croissant Nebula, or Eurosign Nebula, lies just two degrees distance from Seder. Nebula like this one are actually a bit rare and involve a complex wolf riot class star's stellar wind colliding with stellar wind from another star that passed its red giant phase and shed some of its outer layers. It's an odd shape and an odd way to make a nebula. NASA currently has a database of 4,000 confirmed exoplanets at the time this video was uploaded. Of that, 2,300 of them were discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope alone, which searched the area between Lyra, where Vega is, and Cygnus, in particular around Phoeris, for planets transiting other stars. Cygnus at this time holds the record for the most stars currently known to have extrasolar planets. It makes sense though. This section of sky was chosen specifically for Kepler's relatively narrow field of view and allowed Kepler to observe as many star systems at once thanks to how busy this area is. But importantly, it's not full of nebular clouds or busy with newly formed stars that wouldn't have established planets yet. Any of those would have made Kepler's data more difficult to work with. Kepler found in Cygnus what is practically Earth's twin, Kepler 452b. Though not 100% confirmed to exist, this is a place NASA planet hunters have coined Coruscant. It's an Earth-like planet orbiting a Sun-like star at an Earth-like distance in almost exactly one Earth year. However, it's probably about one billion years older than Earth. If conditions that support life on such a planet have had that much more time to evolve, that makes Coruscant, or Kepler-452b, a top target for finding intelligent life, perhaps even in a more advanced form among the stars. You can find Kepler-452 and Earth's cousin near Phoeris. Sun-like stars at this distance aren't very bright at all, so finding the star requires some effort and a little help from a telescope and a digital camera. Phoeris belonged to a different constellation in Middle Eastern astronomy and referred to the riders of that constellation. The head of the swan, or the beak of the hen, is the star Albiero. Albiero and Phoeris are both multiple star systems for different reasons. While Phoeris consists of three stars orbiting one another, they can't be observed to separate in backyard telescopes. However, Albiero is an optical binary. You can see the separation even in a small telescope with modest magnification. Though in this case, the stars are probably not orbiting one another like Phoeris or 61 Cygni. Instead, they are just wonderful to look at because they demonstrate two very different star color types very close together. Albiero is a common target for backyard observing, especially for newcomers to astronomy, because of this beautiful color contrast. Give it a try. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you found this video informative and entertaining. And if you did, hit that like button for me. I've got a bit of work to do on my next two in my Constellation series, Ursa Major and then Scorpio. So if you don't want to miss those, click that subscribe button and ring that bell. If you've got ideas for my Constellation series, or you think I've left something out of this one, let me know in the comments. Until the next one, get outside and learn something new. Subscribe to me, swan.